Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. This is Wayne Callen for Attitude Magazine. Glad you can be with us. We receive lots of emails here at Attitude asking about lifestyle changes to manage a child's ADHD symptoms. Many kids are already taking medication, and parents are hoping that the right combination of exercise, diet, a good sleep regimen, and stress reduction can further contribute to symptom management. The evidence is increasing that these lifestyle changes can help in a major way with ADHD. In his wonderful book, Getting Ahead of ADHD, expert Joel Nigg writes that having a highly nutritious diet and getting exercise and enough sleep are especially effective for kids with ADHD. In the last five years, the scientific view on nutrition has changed from researchers just thinking that diet is a fad and cannot affect ADHD to wait, hold it, maybe it can. In addition, sleep can be the main tool nature uses to grow a child's brain, says Joel Meg. It is an essential part of wiring the brain and learning. And finally, studies suggest that the benefits of exercise on hyperactivity, attention, executive function, and cognition equal about half the effect of medication for children with ADHD. We are pleased to have top expert Sandy Newmark with us today to sort all this out and give us specific strategies on diet, sleep, exercise, and even stress reduction. He is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California and head of the Pediatric Integrative Neurodevelopmental Program at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Dr. Newmark uses an integrative approach to treating children, which means looking at the child as a whole, not just as medical diagnosis, and using the most effective and least harmful therapies to help children succeed. The sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Neba Health. Neba Health Omega-3 can help you maintain healthy brain function, and we believe using the right formulation is key. We developed our formula based on scientific evidence with a great taste and a reasonable price. See shop.nebahealth.com for FDA details. No prescription required. Just so everyone knows, Attitude Webinar sponsors have no role in the selection of guest speakers, the speaker's presentation, or any other aspect of the webinar production. Well, I'll turn it over to Sandy. It's great to have you here today, Sandy. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be here, and I appreciate everybody taking their time to come and be here with me, and I hope we can make it worthwhile. So, uh, uh, as Wayne said, uh, I uh, practice an integrative approach to ADHD, and that means taking looking at the child as a whole person, taking into account all the areas of a child's life, including relationship to family, friends, school, community, not just focusing on one particular aspect, uh, for instance, just how grades are or um, just how things are going at home, because uh, it, uh, it really is important and useful to be able to take everything into account to kind of maximize your child's uh, happiness and effectiveness and resilience. And the other thing to remember is that every child with ADHD is different. Although, you know, ADHD is really a description of uh, a set of, uh, of behaviors, you know, difficulty with focusing, impulsivity, hyperactivity, and of course we have the inattentive kind where there isn't any hyperactivity. But Below those symptoms, these children aren't all the same. They have different, probably, biochemistries and physiologies. And there may be some time where we can uh, know a lot more about that and divide up into ADHD uh, very much based on their exact physiology and biochemistry and genetics, but we're not there yet. So there's a wide variety of things we're calling ADHD, but they may need different kinds of treatment. And that's why it's important to look at the whole child and to look at these areas of nutrition, sleep, stress, exercise as part of uh, any ADHD treatment plan. So I wanted to say that this webinar is absolutely not about the question of medication or no medication. It's not about the risks and benefits of ADHD medication. So uh, all of the things that I suggest today can be used, can be useful, they can be necessary 
whether or not a child is taking medication for ADHD. In fact, a, a few of the studies that I'll quote were done uh, specifically with uh, children taking medication already, and uh, we'll talk about that as we go on. Uh, of, you know, of course, I have my own opinions about uh, medication, uh, which could take a webinar or maybe 10 webinars. But um, what I would just say right now is I think at the least it's important if you're going to use medication to make sure you still are looking at the whole child and making sure that you have all of the important lifestyle uh, factors in place and, and optimized. So let's start with nutrition, or when did Pop-Tarts become a breakfast? I think eating well is a crucial part of the performance and, and the ability of any child with ADHD. And this is now, as, as Wayne mentioned, this is being confirmed more and more by, uh, by actual research. And I think when you think about eating well, I mean, you could think, okay, yeah, so um, Pop-Tarts are probably not a good breakfast and they should, kids shouldn't drink too much soda. But to be more specific, I think one of the most important things you can think of when thinking about feeding a child with ADHD is something called the glycemic index. Now, the glycemic index refers to how soon carbohydrates become blood sugar or turn into sugar in your body. That's exactly what happens to all carbohydrates. But some of them turn into sugar faster and some of them turn into sugar slower. And the ones, when you eat something that turns into sugar fast, we call that being high on the glycemic index. So high is bad on the glycemic index. And what turns into sugar fast is processed carbohydrates. So anything that's really highly ground up, like any type of flour or a Pop-Tart or one of the most common breakfasts I hear about are frozen waffles or pancakes. To, to uh, make a waffle, you have to beat that flour until it's very fine, which makes it much more easily turned into sugar. So when you serve a child a waffle, whether you, whether it's a whole wheat waffle or not, you're taking something that's already... Uh, process going to turn into sugar fast, and then often you're putting sugar or jelly on it, so it's sugar upon sugar upon sugar. And what happens with these children is their blood sugar goes up very quickly, and then the body doesn't like sugar to go up very quickly, and it puts out insulin and other hormones, and it drops that sugar quickly and actually goes below normal. And when blood sugar is below normal, you can have an irritable or fidgety or nervous child. Now, certainly many kids can uh, eat that kind of breakfast and get away with it if they happen to be not very sensitive to that or to be very uh, focused and calm and quiet anyway. But for many children, this is crucial. So what we recommend is a diet that has protein, is a breakfast that has protein, some not very processed carbohydrates, and uh, some fat because fat actually uh, decreases the absorption and processing of, of the carbohydrate into sugar. So, you know, good good breakfast might be oatmeal, especially steel cut oats, which are lower on the glycemic index, or a piece of true whole grain bread with uh, peanut butter and a glass of milk, or an egg, uh, or even some meat, uh, you know, like a, a breakfast meat, as long as I, I doesn't have nitrite to it and uh, other additives. So things like that can be really uh, quite good breakfast. Even, even a good uh, whole grain cereal with milk. What you want to really avoid, of course, is things like waffles, pancakes, Pop-Tarts, uh, and um, anything that's highly processed. Another thing to think about with breakfast is that it doesn't breakfast is kind of a you know a cultural idea that we would eat certain foods for breakfast, but you know there's nothing nutritionally important about that so in fact, it'd be perfectly fine to serve a a bean and cheese burrito for breakfast or some leftovers from last night. It doesn't have to be something we think of as breakfast food. 
And the same would go for lunch. You want to have the same kind of thing for lunch because the child's going to be in school for a few more hours. Now, here's a, just a little study that where they actually took 52 adolescents and they gave them either a no breakfast or a breakfast high on the glycemic index, which remember is the bad one, or low on the glycemic index. And uh, 30 and 120 minutes later, they actually did some testing. And the kids who ate the low GI breakfast, the good one, the unprocessed one, had better executive function, better working memory, which is often a problem in ADHD, and better attention. So uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind. Oh, that's another thing. That picture right there looks like Lucky Charms or something. Another thing to definitely not eat at breakfast. Speaking of which, there's been several studies showing that artificials, artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives not only make ADHD kids more hyper, they tend to make everybody more hyper. In this study, they gave a whole bunch of three-year-olds or eight or nine-year-olds a drink that either had a preservative called sodium benzoate and an artificial color and additives or a placebo, and that was something without all of that stuff. And that artificial color or sodium benzoate drink resulted in increased hyperactivity. And these are in normal three-year-old and eight to nine-year-old children in the general population. In Europe, they take this research so seriously that foods with certain dyes actually have a warning label on them. And it says, this may have an adverse effect on activity and intention in children. And you can believe believe that this changes how people make things. A very interesting story is that Kraft macaroni and cheese was made with artificial yellow, yellow five. Once that warning label came on, they took that out of the food and of the macaroni and cheese in Europe and put in a natural coloring that didn't have this negative effect. However, because it was cheaper, they kept the artificial color here in the United States until just recently when a, a consumer advocates, I don't know, the last year or two, uh, made enough noise so they took it out of there. So the interesting thing, this is kind of an aside, but I think it's important, is people who make food are extremely sensitive to consumer demand. And so anytime that, uh, that consumers uh, do things with their pocketbook, buy things, or make noise, food producers will react because it's a very competitive business. So uh, we see lots of changes based on consumer demand. We can make that happen. I want to tell you about a place. This isn't a research study so much as, as kind of a story, a true story, about a place called Appleton Central High School. Now, this was a high school with very difficult kids. You can read this. Disruptive, truant, problems dysfunctional home environments. This was a really tough high school, completely full of these, these children. And what they did was they got rid of all the junk food and all the, uh, all the soda in the vending machines. And then they started a healthful meal program for both breakfast and lunch. This is a place where all the students ate breakfast there, so it was a good laboratory. And the result was dramatic. As you can see, the principal said, I can say without hesitation that it's changed my job as a principal. Since we've started this program, I've had zero weapons on campus, zero expulsions, zero premature deaths or suicides. You can imagine what a very tough school this was if these are the kind of things that um, the principal was, uh, was happy about. And even the teachers talked about the enormous difference that they saw in the behavior of the students in the classroom. They're on task. They're attentive. They can concentrate for longer periods of time. Remember, this is just one intervention. They didn't give these children medications. They didn't change their home environments, which were most likely extremely difficult and disorganized. They didn't change any of their classes. They didn't change their sleep patterns. They didn't even change what they had for dinner and for the rest of the day. But just getting rid of the vending machines and having a good breakfast and a good lunch completely changed their behavior. 
And the interesting thing is, I don't have the slide, but uh, you can see uh, you can see the menu that they gave them, and it really wasn't uh, a menu that kids wouldn't eat. I mean, it had turkey sandwiches and burritos and all kinds of quite healthy food, and the kids really liked it. So it's not like you have to give quote health food that nobody you know, likes, you know, have a meat spinach all day long or anything. So if it can do that for kids in this kind of a school, just imagine the uh, difference it might make for your child. So that's basically, I could talk for hours about it, of course, but that's uh, generally what I would uh, say for now about uh, just basic good nutrition. Now, what about food sensitivities and elimination diets? Well, it turns out that a significant percentage of kids with ADHD are actually sensitive to some kind of food. And in this study, you can see right here, they took 100 children and they put 50 of them on a very restricted diet. And that was really restricted. Rice, meat, vegetables, pears, water. And after five weeks, 64% of those children had a 40% improvement on their ADHD scales. Now, that's a dramatic improvement. 40% improvement on ADHD rating scales is what you'd like to see with a medication like Ritalin. Now, in this study, the person who was evaluating these children were blinded, but the parents and teachers weren't. So it wasn't a perfect study from a kind of medical point of view. But they followed it up with a second part, which was a double-blind placebo control. I'll go back here a second. The second part was uh, double-blinded, and it, it confirmed that these kids actually reacted to the foods that were taken away. Now, many people, especially sort of skeptical doctors, might say, well, that's just one study. What, what does that prove? And they'd be right. One study doesn't really prove everything. But it turns out they've been doing this study since 1985. In 1985, in The Lancet, which was the most prestigious medical journal in the world, they published this study. And it was essentially the same thing. They put 76 children on what's called an oligoantigenic diet, which is a few foods diet. 62 out of the 76 improved. Then they've completed a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and uh, the same thing happened. And wheat, dairy, artificial colors, and preservatives were the most common thing that triggered these children. Actually, all in all, there's been at least four studies showing that a certain percentage of kids improve if you do an elimination diet. Here, uh, so here's another one, just from the Archives of Disease in Childhood. 78 children, 59 improved, double blind, second phase. So we're seeing this over and over. It actually works. Now I don't, I use uh, an elimination diet that's a little bit different. I don't, uh, I don't put them on this dramatic a diet, mainly because I don't think very many people will do it. I mean, this is a very, very hard diet. What I do rather is I eliminate a set of foods, dairy, wheat, corn, soy, eggs, peanuts. And I do that for three weeks. And if you have no improvement after that three weeks, then you just go back on your regular diet and you say, okay, food sensitivities doesn't seem to be the issue. If you do have improvement, then what you do is you start adding the foods one by one. I usually recommend adding, say, gluten first, although it doesn't matter. And you give it a couple of days of gluten, and then you wait three or four days to see if uh, there are any late developing uh, behaviors. You watch the behavior, and then you say, okay, it was gluten or it wasn't, and you go on to the next phase. So the whole thing takes about six weeks. It, is it difficult? Yes. Is it a pain in the neck? Yes. But if your child happens to be one of the children whose behavior and concentration and ability to do well in school is highly changed by being off one of these foods, it's worth it. I think I find in my practice about 30 to 50% of the children I see do have some food sensitivity. Not as high as these studies, but maybe it's because my diet isn't so strict. So um, uh, it's something I rec recommend for most people. Now, I will say as an aside, a couple of things. In general, I find that the pure inattention type kids don't really respond to this so much. I think something physiologically is different about those kids. 
So I don't tend to do it so much in children who have pure inattentive type ADHD. The second thing um, I will say is if children have a history of allergies, eczema, gastrointestinal issues, those kids I would absolutely recommend doing an elimination diet. I, I do it with kids without all those symptoms, but the kids who, who have the most positive response are the kids with those allergic type uh, manifestations already. So that's food sensitivities. Now we're gonna move on to supplements. The most common supplement that we use in ADHD is fish oil, which is uh, supplementing omega-3 fatty acids. We know a lot about this. This is probably the most studied supplement in all of ADHD. And what do we know? We know that children with ADHD have decreased levels of omega-3 fatty acids in their red blood cells and plasma. And we know that omega-3 supplementation increases those levels. And we also know that omega-3 fatty acids are the kind of fat that are lining the neurons in the brain. Without enough omega-3 fatty acids, your neurons cannot function as efficiently. In fact, what happens is your brain has to use omega-6 fatty acids, which are the kind of thing that come in, in grains, and therefore the neurons will not function as efficiently. We have lots of studies about omega-3 fatty acids for ADHD. We have enough so that there's been a couple of what we call meta-analyses done. A meta-analysis is you take the statistics from a whole bunch of different studies and you put them all together and measure the effect. So basically you're, you're, you're being able to kind of pump up the uh, meaning of the study by, in, by uh, using the results from a whole bunch of children instead of from all the individual studies. So the results were omega-3s, particularly with high doses of EPA, I'll explain about that in a second, were modestly effective in the treatment of ADHD. About 40% as effective as stimulants, like Ritalin, very few and mild side effects. Well, that is pretty impressive to me. 40% as effective as a medication in a, in a supplement that is healthful for you in every sense, that is cheap, relatively, and that has very few side effects. I think that's a tremendous benefit. So I treat every child with ADHD with omega-3 fatty acids in the form of fish oil, unless they happen to be very aggressive fish eaters. If they're kids who eat fish like five, six times a week, high omega-3 kind of fish like salmon or sardines, well, then they don't have to, but I don't really run into that many children who do eat that much fish. There's lots of questions, though, about fish oil. Any of you have been looking on the, in a grocery or a health food store know there's a hundred different brands out there. And what's the right dose? How does it vary by age? And we don't, still don't have enough research to know exact numbers about this. But my recommendation is this. Small kids, less they, than, say, seven or eight, a 1,000 milligrams total DHA plus EPA. What are those? Well, when you, t when you buy a fish oil, if you look at the back, it will tell you how much DHA and EPA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids that are important for the brain, it will tell you how much there are of those. So it doesn't matter how much actual just fish oil there is. It matters how much DHA plus EPA. So my recommendation is 1,000 milligrams total of DHA and EPA. And the ideal ratio is to have one and a half to two times as much EPA as DHA. And that's, uh, that's research which is gleaned from a whole lot of studies. It looks like the high EPA fish oil is what works best. So one and a half to two times as much EPA to DHA. Uh, bigger kids, 2,000 milligrams total. Are all brands the same? No, 
Um, it's uh, there are lots of brands out there, and you have to be careful because fish oil, if it sits around too long, can go bad. And I don't think they all have the same quality. I especially tend to avoid the big box fish oil. I would probably not get my fish oil from Walmart or Walgreens or something like that. There are several really good brands out there. I actually think the Costco brand is pretty good, but even better are things like Nordic Naturals or Carlson's. But I don't want to get too much into the brands, but it's important to choose them carefully. And then how do you get your kids to take this stuff? Well, it can be difficult. Mostly it works out okay. So the first thing to remember is that the gummies don't have enough. Most of the gummies out there, you would have to give a child 12 to 16 gummies a day to get the kind of doses that I'm talking about. So that leaves you with pills for those kids who can swallow them. There's the big fish oil, you know, the big fish oil capsules. There's some half size ones you can get. And then there's a liquid. And now, fortunately, the liquids uh, have been made to uh, taste better for kids. Many are lemon or orange flavored. And I find that most children you can get to take them, either straight off the spoon or sometimes mixed in some strong juice, like orange juice, grape juice, pomegranate juice, something like that. Uh, but very important. The second thing, the second most important supplement in ADHD is iron. What we know is that many kids with ADHD are relatively iron deficient. In this study, you can see that, oh, and how we measure iron is not through just a, a blood count to see if you're anemic or not, by men, but mention, measuring something called serum ferritin. So many kids who have iron deficiency are not anemic. Anemic means you don't have enough iron in your red blood cells. And so a lot of patients tell me, oh, I was checked and my iron is, or my child's iron is fine. That means they usually just did a little finger prick and said, okay, you're not anemic. What that means is there's not enough iron in the red blood cells. And these kids usually do have enough iron in their red blood cells. But the ferritin measures the iron circulating in your body and in your brain. And in those cases, the serum ferritin is often low. Another study, and this one you can see here, they took 23 children whose ferritin was less than 30 and they gave them either iron or a placebo, a fake pill. And ADHD, as measured by the standard way we do it, improved in the iron-taking group and not the placebo. So we know that iron is really important. And there's been quite a number of studies about iron in uh, the literature. In fact, we've actually seen that probably part of how medications work is by influencing iron metabolism in the brain. We've also been able to use functional MRIs, which show us that iron metabolism in the brain is abnormal in some kids with ADHD. Now, iron is not something you just, I can say everyone should give their children because you can have too much iron. It is not healthy to have too much iron in your system. Therefore, you should have a doctor measure your child's serum ferritin. You can just get a simple lab slip, get it measured, and then only supplement if it's necessary. Another mineral that's important is, called, is zinc. Zinc is a, is a metal that's present in everybody, and it's a cofactor in uh, many, many kind of uh, reactions. And we don't have quite as much information about zinc as we do about iron or fish oil, but there's some good studies. And this is one of the ones I was mentioning where they actually did the study in kids on medication. So in this study, they took children who were already on an amphetamine, probably Adderall, and they gave them 15 or 30 milligrams of zinc. And with 30 milligrams of zinc, they found a 37% reduction in the optimal amphetamine dose or Adderall dose. What does that mean? That means they were actually changing the dose of the Adderall to find what worked best. And what worked best was 40, almost 40% less in kids who were taking that 30 milligrams of zinc. So I think it's an important thing to check and treating people 
who are deficient or even in the very low normal range. Now, you could probably give certainly 20 milligrams of zinc to maybe even 30 to any child who uh, any child without uh, very much danger. So it's um, it's not something you necessarily have to measure. But since uh, most of the time I recommend children have their ferritin measured anyway, I go ahead and uh, get the zinc measured, and it helps me in treatment. Finally, vitamin D and ADHD. This is kind of a newer area we're just starting to get study in, but here's some studies that have happened. When mothers took vitamin D during pregnancy, their children had fewer ADHD symptoms at two and a half years old. Children with ADHD tend to have lower levels of vitamin D in their blood. And in another study, children taking methylphenidate, Ritalin, had improvement in their symptoms when vitamin D was added. So again, another area where we can improve on the medication. Now, we don't have the kind of studies that uh, we would love to see where we took you know, 100 kids with ADHD and gave 50 of them vitamin D and 50 of them not without any medication involved. Um, I, hopefully those will be coming. But um, I recommend that vitamin D levels be measured and that um, you treat so that the level is at least 30 or more. I like to see it in the 40 or 50 range, actually. Vitamin D is very, very safe. It's very, very easy to give. It comes in little tiny capsules or drops, and it's really quite hard to overdose on. So a good, a safe, effective supplement. And there's lots of other reasons to make sure your child has enough vitamin D. Vitamin D comes from the sun, and many, many children don't get the kind of sun that they used to get maybe a generation ago. Um, and especially in the winter, it can uh, sink really low. And it, it's vitamin D is involved in many, many aspects of, uh, of human biology, and it's important to have uh, normal levels. Okay, I'm not going to talk about a lot of herbs here, but I am going to talk about one herb that I like, which is called ginkgo. Ginkgo is an herb that uh, has come from India, has been used for hundreds, maybe thousands of years for improving cognitive function. And in this study, um, they took 66 children who were all, again, taking Ritalin, and they gave 33 of them ginkgo and 33 of them a placebo. And after six weeks, there was a significant improvement for their attention, not their hyperactivity which makes sense because ginkgo is actually uh, a herb that is used for attention and not for activity level. So we've had a couple of other little studies, uh, not a great deal of literature about ginkgo and ADHD, but I think it's worth trying in kids who have difficulties with their attention. And I've had, I've had mixed luck. Some parents tell me that it doesn't seem to do anything at all, and then they just go ahead and stop it. And I'm, some parents notice a big difference when, when I add the ginkgo. It comes in either pills or a liquid, and the side effects are usually mild and not, not a big problem, but sometimes there's some GI side effects. So then I wanted to talk about the problem of pesticides and toxins in ADHD, because this is really a big problem. We know that pesticides cause changes in people's brains. And this uh, relates to autism, ADHD, learning disabilities. Many, many developmental problems are influenced by pesticides. In this study, which is a huge study, 1,139 children, those children who had more than the average level of pesticides in their urine, which is where pesticides go, as, as they're excreted by the body, had twice the odds of having ADHD. And those kids who had higher levels were more likely to have ADHD. So the exposure to pesticides is correlated with ADHD symptoms. This is another study about that. So this is measured just basic child development and they took children and measured their, the amount of one particular pesticide in the blood, in the umbilical cord, 
And then they looked at those kids when they were 13 months old. And those children who had the high levels had worse mental and motor development when they were 13 months old. And by the way, does eating organic help? Yes. Children who ate organic fruits and vegetables had a fifth the level of organophosphate pesticides in their urine. So children can actually reduce their exposure to pesticides by eating organic fruits and vegetables. Now I know that organic fruits and vegetables can be expensive. Organic foods can be expensive in general. But thank goodness recently, even the big box grocery stores are, carry, are starting to carry significant amounts of organic fruits and vegetables. Walmart, Costco, Safeway, yes, they're slightly more expensive, but not nearly as bad as when you had to go to uh, Whole Foods or some specialty health food store to get your organics. I mean, if you can afford it, I recommend eating everything organic but um, especially the fruits and vegetables, I, I think is a good place to start. Uh, organic meats can still be very, very expensive. And um, if you can do that, great. If not, well, then you just concentrate on what you can do. But getting back to the uh, pesticide exposure again, well, what can you do about that? Well, obviously there's, um, there's the indoor pesticide exposure. I recommend that kids stay away from, uh, or the families stay away from using any indoor pesticides. Um, there's usually natural treatments for about any kind of bug you can have in your house. I also avoid, I would avoid any kind of scented uh, chemical fragrances in your dishwasher soap or your, or your detergent. You can use natural things like seventh generation because those also might have uh, uh, caused chemical sensitivity. Uh, same thing with outdoor lawns and gardens. Try and uh, try and not use pesticides as much as you can, because kids will pick that up, and younger kids are much more sensitive to these things. So that's another just uh, simple lifestyle thing to think about. So here's a kind of a list: avoid pesticides when you can, eat organic when possible. If it's an older house, watch for lead contamination. Lead is uh, extremely to toxic. Uh, most of the newer houses don't have lead paint or lead pipes, but some of the older houses do. You should have your child tested and your house tested if it's older. Consider using a, a water filter because uh, depending on where you live, some of the waters can have some degree of pesticides or heavy metals or other toxins that you would rather not be in your uh, body. And then watch out. I think most of you have read about the BPA and there's other toxins and plastics that you really don't want to be in exposed to that seem to cause permanent changes in the body. Um, I would not cook anything in anything plastic and uh, use non-BPA and safe plastics. Moving away, we're going to talk about something else called behavioral management, or basically this is parenting. I find in my practice, especially with the kind of hyper and oppositional ADHD children, that many parents are frustrated, confused, angry, helpless, guilty about what seems to them as a lack of parenting success. They, you know, they're doing uh, what they consider good parenting. It may be the same parenting that they successfully use with their older children. It may be the same parenting they see with their uh, friends using, and yet it's not working. And what happens with this frustration you end up with these sort of maladaptive patterns where there's high levels of criticism of the child, a lot of negative emotions, yelling and screaming. And often you get into a, a pattern where on one hand, parents are, are critical and angry and yelling. And on the other hand, kind of giving up and letting the child get away with anything. It's really hard. And changing this dynamic is crucial and it can make a dramatic difference in a child's behavior and success. Now, there's many different pa uh, parenting approaches. Generally, they're all under the rubric of positive parenting. I think it's important to look at, to look at the, what's available out there and just pick one and give it a reasonable trial. 
Some of them are listed here, parent management training, collaborative problem solving, and the nurtured heart approach. The nurtured heart approach is one that I generally recommend myself. It's detailed in a book called Transforming the Difficult Child by Howard Glasser. Uh, I find it to, to be extremely successful for many children. Many parents have told me it makes a dramatic difference in their lives and the lives of their children. Just as an example, there's a school in Tucson where I practiced in my earlier years called the Tolson School. And this was a school in the low-income part of a town with uh, many uh, people who didn't have very much money. And it was a failing school, which uh, means it was just not doing well. And the principal of the school instituted the nurtured heart behavioral approach in the entire school, from her to the vice principal, to the teachers, to the counselors, to everybody. And this, this is another positive parenting approach, just based on positive feedback, clear rules, well-defined consequences, but given without a lot of emotionality and energy. Within this school, discipline problems dropped, special education dropped from 31 to 7, and the percentage of kids in this school on medication dropped to 0.3%. And in most schools, it's 5 to 10 to 15%. While that was happening, instead of a failing school, it became a performing plus school with better test scores, which is a very big deal in Arizona. So it's just an example of how powerful behavior and discipline interventions can be. Exercise. We are getting more and more and more information indicating how incredibly important exercise is. It should be a part of every child's life, but every child with ADHD. We didn't evolve over hundreds of thousands of years to be sitting at a desk or a computer for most of the day. And what we know now is that exercise triggers what we call epigenetic changes that make the brain grow and get more efficient. We know it increases production of BDNF. I wrote it out for you there, which is essential to normal brain function. Epigenetic changes mean it actually changes the way the uh, DNA works, actually what proteins are turned on and off. One hour a day for kids is optimal, or maybe even minimal, but increase it as much as you can. And research indicates that exercise improves academic scores better than adding that amount of, of class or study time. So it's very, very important. There's lots of options, obviously. Uh, many, uh, the sports are, are great, if, but many kids with ADHD don't like team sports. It's hard for them to focus on everything that's going on. They get bored. Baseball is a great example. Tennis, swimming, rock climbing, other individual sports that are intense and focused may be better. Martial arts can be really great. You have to find the right teacher. If physical education is well done, that counts as exercise time. Unfortunately, many schools, PE is down to once or twice a week. And just playing outside with friends when possible. And I highly recommend against sacrificing exercise time for tutoring or because of poor grades. It'll just end up making things worse. Finally, sleep. Sleep is incredibly important for children with ADHD. It affects behavior, behavior, attention, learning. We actually know now that sleep isn't just resting. We consolidate what we learn during sleep. Many studies have shown that if somebody is taught something and then sleeps, they actually learn it better than if they don't sleep. And you can see the hours listed right here. And um, most of our children are not getting enough sleep, especially our teenagers who are staying up late and getting on social media. Barriers to adequate sleep is our entire society, work schedules, sports and other activities, electronics and social media, too much homework. We have kids who are sneaking, waiting till the lights are out and their parents are in bed, getting out their phones and being on social media half the night. They're exhausted. They can't do anything. And yet it's, it's addictive. So parents have to be very, very proactive about keeping that out of their rooms at night. 
sleep apnea is something you need to worry about. It's when kids uh, snore and can't uh, really uh, breathe well at night, and then they can't function well in the day. So improving sleep, we use sleep hygiene. One hour before bed, you turn off the screens, you quiet things down, you have a good routine. Don't have TV in the bedroom. And if there's still serious issues, then you can consult the medical providers and there's options, 5-HTP, valerian, melatonin, or even talking with a behavioral professional, a psychologist or counselor can help uh, work with sleep routines. About teenagers, what can I do? Start um, social media, social media, social media. That problem needs to be given as much priority as a 504 plan or medication management. I'm going to finish up real quick now, but stress is a really important thing. Children with ADHD are more sensitive to stress. They're more likely to encounter stress, and it's going to make stress worse. So it's really important to support your child in any way you can decrease the amount of stress that they have. And make sure your child is doing something every day that he or she enjoys and is good at. So my final thoughts, focusing on fostering a happy, confident, and resilient child will be of greater long-term benefit than focusing too narrowly on school success. And diet, sleep, exercise, and stress are the way to do that. And uh, I'll stop and answer questions now. Okay. That was excellent. We have at least five parents or moms or dads asking, can you repeat the foods you systematically remove from a diet to test for food sensitivity? They want to... Dairy, wheat or gluten, corn, soy, eggs, peanuts. Okay. Speaking of sleep, uh, one mom asks that ever since her son has been on medication, it's been disruptive to his sleep. Uh, So she's wondering if she should stop the medication or at least adjust the dosage. But the medication, uh, the methylphenidate, seems to be bothering her son. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, one of the most common known side effects of the medication. I would talk to your doctor. Um, Sometimes you can adjust the medication, uh, uh, drop the dose down and still have it effective. Sometimes you'll try another uh, medication um, and some which might work just as well and not cause the sleep problems. And then the other thing is uh, melatonin can be very, very helpful in this situation. Yes. Could you give a uh, quick tutorial about melatonin? Because from what I understand, parents, or at least the dosages that the melatonin comes in might be too high. Uh, Yeah. So melatonin is the hormone that makes us go to sleep at night and wake up in the morning. And for many reasons, uh, especially electronics, uh, screens actually keep us from producing melatonin. So for many, and um, teenagers' melatonin cycles are dramatically different, and they shouldn't be going to bed. At, uh, they shouldn't be going to school at eight o'clock. They should be going to school at ten o'clock. But in any case, um, you can give melatonin, and the dose really varies a lot by by the child. And so I start with half a milligram. Try that for a couple of days and see if it works. Go to a milligram, see if that works, and you can go all the way up to five milligrams with no problem at all. So you just find the dose that works the best. The, the way to get those smaller doses is you buy a liquid form, and then you can just get what dose you want. And once you mm-hmm. figure it out, you can go to a pill. On the omega-3, several uh, parents have asked because their children are vegetarians, and they were asking about, can I substitute flaxseed oil? Okay, very interesting question. So flax, remember we were talking about EPA and DHA? Well, flaxseed oil doesn't have... EPA and DHA. It has omega-3s, which the body has to convert to EPA and DHA. So um, some people don't convert that very well. So it's not a sure thing to give the flaxseed oil. What you can use is um, Nordic Naturals makes an omega-3 algae oil, which is made from algae and does have EPA and DHA. So that's another alternative. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions about parents wondering about the benefits of magnesium. So I thought I would just ask you about oh, magnesium. Yeah, that's a good one. If, if I had more time, I might have talked about that. Magnesium uh, is can be good for calming in kids with ADHD. It, it doesn't necessarily increase their attention, but calming and soothing, it can work. And I use it uh, to help before sleep sometimes. And also some kids who take medication, they have a rebound effect. In other words, they, they take the medication in the morning, they're doing good, 
all day and then like three, four or five o'clock at night, suddenly they're super hyper or irritable or angry. And magnesium can be really uh, helpful for that. So it can be useful. You can use it in ter- in by, uh, by mouth or even uh, sitz baths or magnesium. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't usually, I used to measure it, but the body uh, actually keeps very tight control of magnesium levels. So it was rare that I found it to be off, but you can give a, you can give magnesium without measuring it. Mm-hmm. Do essential oils have a place in um, either calming or uh, children who are hyperactive? Because several parents have asked, do essential, is there a role for essential oils in, in uh, you know, optimizing yeah. my kids' symptoms? Yeah, I think, I think they could be mildly helpful. and uh, They don't have dramatic effects usually, but um, some of my parents you know, use essential oils, especially at night for calming. Uh, lavender oil is... Um, you know, really a, a, a common one. And it can, it can help kids kind of relax and calm down somewhat. That's the main way that I, I've seen them used. I don't use them much myself. Um, you need to be careful with them. You know, you, they have to be, you know, put in a dispenser. They should never be swallowed. You mm-hmm. Keep them out of the reach of small children. Uh, another question about is yoga or meditation helpful? In, in... Uh, yeah, I wish that I sort of had to rush through that in the end. I think yoga okay. and meditation are can be really great, and there's actually a number of studies now about um, a particular kind of meditation called uh, mindfulness meditation uh, or mindfulness-based stress reduction, which has been being used and taught in the schools. It's a kind of meditation that has absolutely no kind of religious overtones in it, so it can be taught to everybody. And it's been actually shown in a few preliminary studies to be helpful for kids' focus and attention, not just kids with ADHD. So if you can get your child to do yoga or uh, mindfulness or uh, another kind of meditation, that would be great. A couple parents have asked for you to repeat the title of that Howard Glasser book on the nurtured heart approach. Yes. Yes. Transforming the difficult child. Okay. Another. I know I'm rapid firing these at you, but you know, okay. No yeah. Is there any evidence for uh, a high protein diet improving? Common recommendations are have some protein. Uh, don't walk out the door unless you have, you know, whatever, 20 to 30 grams of protein, and you should add some protein to your lunch and your dinner. Is there enough studies or a lot of studies to justify that? I would say no. I would say this is a recommendation I make, I make to make to get a reasonable amount of protein at breakfast and lunch, but we really don't have the studies. What we have is, is the kind of... Uh, the opposite study, which if, if your breakfast is too much high, pro, high processed carbs, then mm-hmm. you will do worse. And so ah. it just sort of makes sense that you're going to decrease the carbs. Well, what are you going to add? You're going to add some protein and some fat. So I just recommend a balanced breakfast with, you know, you, I don't think you have to go ahead and, you know, give 30 or 40 grams of protein in a, in a breakfast. Um, mm-hmm. Remember that for an average child needs only one gram of protein per kilogram per day. So if you have a 60-pound child, they need about 30 grams of protein per day. Well, that's not a ton. You don't have to give that child 30 grams of protein at breakfast. Mm-hmm. So that's one way to think about it. But just to have some protein, some fat, and some carbs at breakfast, I think, is what we know is, is good. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think that'll have to be the last question. Uh, that was terrific. Great information and strategies. So we appreciate you being here. It was a fabulous presentation. So thank you again. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Once again, the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Neba Health. Neba Health Omega-3 can help you maintain healthy brain function, and we believe using the right formulation is key. We developed our formula based on scientific evidence with a great taste and a reasonable price. See shop.nebahealth.com for FDA details. No prescription required. Have a good day, everyone. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A D D I T U D E M A G.com. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. 
With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.